U.S. President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden each claim to be ahead in the U.S. presidential election, even as the final outcome hangs on a razor edge, with both sides ramping up for legal action. The Trump campaign is challenging vote counts in likely key states of Wisconsin, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. Already, U.S. media have projected a Biden win in Michigan, Arizona, and Wisconsin. But no result has been declared in Pennsylvania, where the counting of votes is still ongoing. Winning all three of these Ross Belt states will hang Joe Biden's victory. Last night, Joe Biden stopped short of declaring that he had won, but he said he was confident he was on the course to defeat Donald Trump. Overall, turnout in Tuesday's election was projected to be the highest in the 120 year at 66.9, according to the U.S. Election Project. Uh, Biden has the support of 70.5 million voters, which is no one, it's about 71 million this morning, the most won by any presidential candidate ever, while Trump has polled in 67.2 million votes, uh, 4 million more than he gained in 2016. The beta election race was dominated by coronavirus pandemic, which hit a new record high of 103,000 daily cases in the U.S. on Wednesday, according to COVID tracking projects. A lot to unpack here. The greatest turnout, you know, or the greatest number of popular votes ever for anybody in the presidential election in America. Even Reagan didn't get 71 million. <laughs> Even Obama did, and Obama had the record, and yeah. Biden has now beaten Obama's record. Yeah. Trump might end up beating Obama's record, too, by the yeah. time the count is done. It just goes to show that this is such a make-or-break election. Every four years we hear in America, this is the most important election in history. But this time it really does seem to be true. And, of course, nobody ever expected a man like Donald Trump to go quietly. <laughs> He's making a huge fuss. There are about 300 lawsuits at the moment in 45 states. And he's making all kinds of pronunciations, including... Um, He's won the election. He's, there's an attempt to rob him, voter fraud. He sent his son and his lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and they are casting doubts on the votes being cast, saying that Republicans have not been allowed to take a look at the ballots. There have been allegations that using a Sharpie in some states has caused sort of the ink to bleed into the next column and then invalidated people's votes. There are all kinds of accusations. And he's actually really attacking the very fabric of American democracy. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. Well, first, uh, yesterday morning when we were analyzing this, we thought that uh, President Trump was ahead. And there were some of our, you know, commentators who felt that, oh, President Trump was going to win. But things changed very quickly yeah. as, in, uh, as the uh, mail-in votes were counted and as results came in from uh, uh, other parts of the uh, country. But as at this morning, uh, we're down to about five major battleground states. And what happens in those five battleground states uh, as at the end of today could determine uh, what happens. But of course, President, uh, Vice President Joe Biden seems to be in a comfortable place. What are those five uh, battleground states? Georgia, North Carolina, Arizona, Nevada. And if you look at the uh, various states, uh, President Trump appears to be ahead. Uh, OK, I left out Pennsylvania. Uh, President Trump seems to be ahead at the moment in Georgia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, while uh, President, uh, Vice President Biden is ahead uh, in Nevada. But in most of those states, you see that it's really very close. In Pennsylvania, for example, as at yesterday, um, uh, uh, Trump was leading with over 200,000 votes. Now, today, as at this morning, that margin has re reduced to about 79,000 79, plus. But there are still about 756,000 votes to still be counted. And most of those votes in Pennsylvania are mailing votes. And the mailing votes we have seen uh, tend to favor uh, the Democrats uh, a lot more. Now, Pennsylvania is 20. 20 votes, 20 electoral Electoral votes. votes yeah. Now, if you move uh, to, say, um, Arizona, Arizona, some papers have called uh, uh, Arizona for uh, Vice President Biden, yeah. where you have 11 electoral votes. But some uh, you know, uh, platforms have not added Arizona. That's why in some uh, reports, you will see 253 uh, electoral votes for Joe Biden. Uh, you will see uh, 214 uh, for President Trump, electoral votes, that is. But some uh, platforms that have added the 11 electoral votes uh, from uh, Arizona uh, will say uh, Joe Biden has 
54 ready 264, 264 yeah. while uh, you know president uh, trump has uh, uh, 2, 214 uh, 231 so if you look at it whichever one you choose uh, those states the remaining votes there are electoral votes just a little above 70 or let's just say 70 if you don't uh, bother about alaska which is uh, basically red and these votes there are very small anyway so whatever happens if you look at if you give uh, president uh, trump uh, the uh, 214, for example, even if he wins uh, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina, he still would not be able to beat uh, Vice President Biden. And that's why I said President Biden seems to be in a comfortable place. Now, if indeed uh, 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 Biden already has 264 votes, it means if he wins just maybe Nevada. Nevada, give him that. That's six electoral colleges. Yes. Plus six is gone. And Nevada has a well four. But if it takes uh, uh, Nevada or it takes maybe uh, uh, Georgia, because even in Georgia, you know, the margin is uh, very so close. close. Very. So at the moment, you know, I think before the end of tomorrow, we should have uh, uh, clear certainty. Georgia, the votes counted about 98%. Uh, North Carolina, 94% counted. Uh, Pennsylvania, 89% counted. Nevada, 75% counted. Arizona, 86% counted. And in many of these places, you know, it's still very close. And there are speculations or projections that uh, Vice President Biden can take Pennsylvania. Yes. If he takes Pennsylvania yes. alone, or he wins, he manages to win maybe about 60, 70% of the outstanding 756,000 votes, then he's home and In fact, speaking of Pennsylvania, when all of this started, the first thing, the first message the Biden team put out when the margin was high in Pennsylvania for Trump was, everybody calm down. When our mailing votes come in, we will win Pennsylvania. The Biden team had been saying this since yesterday. So they are very confident of Penn as then a result We, we of also that. need to worry about what is happening. In Phoenix, Arizona, uh, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, the uh, Trump supporters, they are saying the, that the vote, uh, the uh, counting must continue because they hope they would, uh, you know, win there. Meanwhile, in Pennsylvania, Stop and Wisconsin, the, the position is uh, the counting. opposite. Yeah. So oh, yeah. I see uh, the it's Trump ridiculous. camp panicking because the prospect of defeat is staring them uh, in the face. And they're oh, yeah. using the same strategy they used in 2000. Guess what they did? When they were going to call a recount in Florida, they used Roger Stone, same Roger Stone, to cause a riot so that the recount was not going to be successful. That's what they have done with Rudy Giuliani and Eric Trump outside in Philadelphia. This is even worse than 2000, it's even I have worse to than say. But you raise a really good point <laughs> about some outlets giving Biden 264. Yeah. And you know what's surprising? Some of those outlets are right-wing outlets. That's yes. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't want to say who. <laughs> but, that really but, surprised but, but, me. But what comes to us here is that a Nigerian woman, Esther Agbaje, our own Nigerian, has been elected into the Minnesota House of Representatives in the U.S. general elections. Uh, Agbaje, who won the district representing 59B in the 134 uh, member house of platform of the Democratic Farmer Labor Party, an affiliate of the U.S. Democratic Party, won by a landslide, polling 17,396 votes or 74.7% of the total ballots cast to defeat our closest rival, Alan Shaplensky of the Republican Party, who polled 4,128, representing 17% of the votes cast. A 35 year old Nigerian woman graduated from uh, George Washington University in DC with a degree in political science holds a master's in public administration uh, from the University of Penn, Pennsylvania, uh, with a law degree from Harvard University. Agbaje once served as a U.S. Department of State as a foreign affairs officer charged with handling the rule of law project in Middle East and currently works a, as an attorney in Minneapolis with a focus on general civil litigation and medical practice. Nine of them in this race as Nigerians, you know, and um, we're excited that least... Nigerians are doing it in of the course, house. Of course she won. Yeah. I mean, is anybody surprised? Congratulations <laughs> to Esther Raji. We're very proud of her. We're so proud of her. Well, ni uh, congratulations to our nine Nigerian Americans, uh, you know, ran for positions at various levels, both yeah. federal and local. Yeah. And as I said this morning, what we hear is that three of them have been elected. Uh, Esther Agbaje uh, from District uh, 59B uh, in uh, Minnesota. And uh, there is also Oye, Owulewa, yeah. uh, who is a shadow representative elected to represent the District of Columbia. And there is a gentleman called uh, uh, Namdi uh, uh, Chukocha, 
I think it's Chukocha. Yeah. Yes, that's his uh, surname, representing District 1, Delaware. He is uh, being re-elected. He had uh, been elected into the uh, Delaware uh, House of uh, Representatives in 2018, and he has uh, been reappointed. And it's quite uh, exciting to see yeah. these Nigerians uh, getting involved in local politics and national politics in the United States and representing us well. But the question still remains, why we celebrate here? I return to that same question I raised the other time. Do they identify as Nigerians? Because when you look at their individual profiles, these are persons who are really actively involved in American, American politics. politics. But, uh, the, okay, that's all we have. We'll go on, uh, that's all we'll have. We'll take a short break. We have the Rotus, uh, Rotus Michael and Wilson, uh, Michael Wilson and Alyssa Omura to give us updates on global and Africa and COVID-19. Stay with us. Our pleasure to have you back, still the Rise News Channel right here. And uh, our dependable Rotus Odiri is here to give us Africa business update. Rotus, over to you. My pleasure. Good morning, uh, Rufai. Good morning, Sundu. Good morning, Doctor. Um, yeah, so the, uh, what we're looking at is a uh, public relations firm uh, in Abuja, Gatefield, Nigeria Limited. Apparently, they're, they're uh, suing uh, Access Bank uh, in court for, apparently, uh, according to court documents, uh, blocking uh, their accounts that were linked to the protests that, we've, that we saw a couple weeks ago. They're saying the account was used to raise funds to support independent Nigerian journalists that were covering the protests um, across uh, the country and also to assist them. And they said they noticed that after some time they were not able to carry out uh, transactions on the accounts. Now, according to uh, uh, bank sources, uh, this is, you know, sources in the industry, in the financial industry, uh, they're saying that the bank apparently got orders from above. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's still being looked at. But the big picture, though, is the legality of blocking an account without getting a court order. Um, I, th I think the normal process is to get a court order before uh, accounts can be, you know, re restricted in a sense. So that's what's being um, being challenged uh, at this point. I mean, remember, you know, the flutter wave, the flutter wave issue with uh, the um, feminist co uh, account when they were raising funds to assist. Um, NSARS protesters, and then they had to find alternate means of getting um, getting access to funds from contributions and so on and so forth. So this is uh, again going to be it's in a, a federal court in Abuja, and I think they're suing for a hundred million naira um, in in damages. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how how that plays out and what the uh, what the court rules. Um, to the you've just talked about the elections. Um, with, I'm still I'm fixated on what happens with uh, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Wela and the WTO. Um, with, the, with how things have changed now, and it's um, looking like uh, Joe Biden will possibly you know, be the next president of the United States. One wants to, we now want to see if they will, the WTO will still proceed with their uh, next meeting on the 9th of November. Now, remember, they said initially that they were thinking of uh, postponing that meeting on the 9th, that general council meeting where they will formally, conf uh, you know, uh, it's believed that they will formally confirm her as the uh, next uh, director general of uh, WTO. But they said because of the cases that were rising, that is the coronavirus spikes in, in Geneva, where they're where they based, they, they decided to push it back. Now, some eyebrows were raised over that because, you know, everyone's been doing virtual conferences and you could easily use technology to meet and make your conf confirmation known. It's suspected that they were playing for time, using this announcement to play for time until, well, based on a gamble, based on the gamble that Joe Biden wins the, the election and then January 20th or 21st, after his inauguration, then they can now say, okay, we've got a friendlier person in office who we can now dialogue with for more multilateral trade agreements versus uh, the bilateral agreements that are agreed upon by Trump, who, of course, is not 
hasn't been that friendly to the WTO. And it's not just the WTO. If you look at Mr. Gabriesus, uh, the Ethiopian that runs the World Health Organization, I think he might, you know, based on events, recent events over the last 24, 48 hours, he could also be breathing a sigh of relief uh, as well because Donald Trump, you know, said he was going to pull, uh, fun, pull his membership and funding away from the World Health Organization. So then uh, the WTO, the European Union, I mean, um, it's going to be interesting to see how things uh, play out. But of course, you know, nothing set in stone. Doctor already did the analysis there with the outstanding votes and the battleground states. Uh, so we'll see. But I think it looks like so far, the WTO's suspected gamble has uh, has paid off. Mm, amazing, amazing times here. Uh, yeah, we we all saw that coming. Even if they lied about coronavirus uh, being a reason, there was a lot of uncertainty. But that still shows you that, to a very large extent, America still wields a lot of power in all of this. And uh, the tussle that goes on between America and China, what I term to be the to see this trap. Uh, still tilts towards America because once America flagged it and said, okay, we have a candidate uh, that will do uh, according to what we want and that will be able to help us with our trade policies and the likes, uh, then everything was stopped. The system was stopped. And when you look at it historically, America still keeps beating itself because it was one of the people that helped China get into WTO in 2001 and that has helped China to show up its trade and the likes. So it just shows you the politicking going on in that regard. So let's see if they'll do that meeting, as you stated. But once Joe Biden comes in, if he gets elected, things will get easier. He's got a different trade policy from what, you know, uh, Donald Trump has got. Let's not forget that Donald Trump was the one that uh, upturned NAFTA, for instance, uh, got in a new trade deal and things like that. Let's see if that's going to be sustainable in the Joe Biden administration and the like. Because if you don't forget, NAFTA was the deal was completed in 94 on the uh, uh, President Clinton then in America. So let's see how this pans out. But it just goes to a large extent to show the politicking and what is happening in the world all over. But... Uh, just like I can't, it's so close to call, but I, I, I want to confidently call congratulations for Ngozi Okonjo Wella right now because I think it's a done deal already. Well, we honestly. hope so. I want to comment on this issue with the freezing of bank accounts. There have been so many cases about this, and the courts frown on banks unilaterally freezing customers' bank accounts. And Adidamola and GTB, the banks were basically lambasted for following blindly, as the court felt, Section 34 of the EFCC Act, which in EFCC claims a right to freeze a customer's account based on a criminal investigation. And the court held that a court order must precede that kind of freezing and described it in very strong terms, like brazen violation of the customer's rights and banks must not be toothless in defending their customers. And also in Odutala and Diamond Bank, this gentleman, uh, Mr. Odutala, was paid a lawyer actually he was paid 25 million naira damages because diamond bank froze his accounts seemingly unilaterally on the request of efcc without a court order so i'm really interested to see how this plays out as somebody who has been on the receiving end of this kind of treatment from a military government i was very little you know but still my family members had bank accounts frozen unilaterally this kind of behavior is extremely disturbing in a democracy when the claim is that a government institution instructs a bank to freeze people's accounts because you don't like you don't like them you don't like their perspective it's unacceptable Indeed. Well, on the access bank case i think yes uh, we have uh, before us the case made uh, by uh, uh, the petitioner um, and then of course we don't have the access bank side of the story yet but of course it will be an interesting uh, case with regard to uh, the powers of a bank uh, to just unilaterally or not or otherwise uh, you know freeze a customer's uh, accounts. Is it possible that Access Bank actually got a court order? Um, under what circumstances uh, did all of this happen? But of course, it will be a case that will be uh, of great interest uh, to customers, persons who have had issues uh, with uh, banks. And the uh, truth is right. Uh, sometimes the security agencies will claim that uh, they are investigating a, a particular account. Bankers talk about the flagging of your account. And you just go to the bank and you discover that you cannot access it. Now, some people take it for granted and they just move on and hope that the bank would uh, change its mind at a later uh, date. But most people, of course, will not take it lying low. Uh, they will go to court immediately. But let's see how the case uh, works out so that Access Bank will not uh, claim 
that uh, his own side of the story has not been uh, presented. But once it's in court, the court, of course, will ensure that justice is done. As for uh, President, uh, the, uh, the emergence of uh, President uh, Biden, uh, yes, well, we all uh, heaved a sigh of relief yeah. uh, when it looked like uh, uh, Joe Biden was ahead. Uh, and in fact, you'll be surprised, internationally, across the world, as uh, 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 Vice President Biden flipped some of those critical states, uh, yesterday, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Arizona are also likely to go to him. People were jubilating that it will be a new day uh, for America. Uh, and multilateral institutions are likely uh, to have a better relationship with the Biden uh, presidency, yeah. uh, as opposed to the kind of unilateralism and isolationism uh, that uh, President uh, Trump uh, pushed. Uh, I, I guess by the end of tomorrow, we will know uh, what will happen in the American election. But what is clear? However, is that, look, there is a very strong Trump base in the, in the United States. That's, that's something that this election has shown, particularly when you look at the electoral map and the, the number of reds uh, that you find there. But, of course, the critical thing is the electoral vote, which at this moment favors uh, uh, President Biden. And most importantly, to unite the country. Oh, oh I'm already calling him President, President Biden. Biden. I'm, well, I'm, I'm rehearsing. Yeah. It's a form of rehearsal. <laughs> but, but, but most importantly, like you said, Dr. Abati, to unite the country. And I'm happy that uh, President Biden, <laughs> let me follow Dr. Abati's lead, came out yesterday to say, you know, under me, there will be no blue or red America. It's going to be the United States of America. It's really very important. I'll give you historical perspective. Elections are very critical. What led to the civil war in America? Prior to the election that brought in Lincoln, the Confederate states had said if Lincoln got elected, because Lincoln was pushing you know, to end slavery in the South, that if Lincoln got elected, they were going to go to war. And soon after, the American Civil War started three months after Lincoln was elected. Mm. So whatever it is, whatever it will take, anybody that becomes president must unite America. Well, white supremacy is still alive and kicking, unfortunately, mm. in America since the days of the Civil War. It's so right. tragic. Right. right. Well, the, uh, uh, president Trump divided the country. Mm. Mm. Don't let us forget that. Really With his uh, different style that he will bring to the table, we imagine that Vice President Biden uh, will do a lot much better to heal the country. Yeah. The U.S. needs to go through a process of healing and reconciliation. And uh, uh, once uh, the election is called and uh, it's President Biden uh, that will take over on January 20, uh, it should, before even that uh, inauguration day, begin the process of taking Americans through a process of healing. All right. We'll go to Michael now. But just for good measure, a transition website has been set up of Biden-Harris already. <laughs> I saw that. Michael Wilson, over to you this morning from London. Thanks very much indeed. Well, as you've noticed, yes, it looks like Joe Biden will be the next US president by the slimmest of margins, but it's a very hollow victory. The Democrats have not regained control of the Senate. There probably will be court cases, as you know, there probably will be recounts and so on. Um, but with the status quo um, seemingly inevitable ill now in the US, the Asian markets actually uh, benefited from that. They followed Wall Street's Lead yesterday, the Nikkei up, um, powering ahead. Uh, today, Nikkei is 1.25% higher. Uh, Cosby up 1.42. The Shanghai Court Composite up uh, about half a percent. CSI and so on. And actually, that news that we had yesterday that I drew your attention to about the uh, Ant Financial's IPO cancellation, no effect whatsoever in Hong Kong, and the markets went on. The Chinese president has just said, just said that China will import more than $22 trillion worth of goods over the next decade. He's called for a more open relationship with the rest of the world uh, and opening its uh, opening its economy to the rest of the world um, after they got over, or they, they say they've got COVID-19 under control. So it looks like the Democrats will re remain contr in control of the House of Representatives. Republicans will hold on to their Senate majority. Um, so therefore, Mr. Biden, should he become the president, will find it very, very difficult indeed to push through his election manifesto. And there will not be a massive coronavirus stimulus scheme. On the other hand, he won't be able to clamp down on tech companies and there won't be bigger uh, lifting, a bigger lifting of corporate taxes. That's what the markets are saying this morning. And uh, you can see why um, the markets actually in the United States did well yesterday. Apart from the Democrats, they have once again failed. 
they failed to field a candidate who's actually couldn't cross the considerable fissures that exist in the US uh, as, as we speak. And they underestimated President Trump's um, uh, fan base, if you like, the, the, which we all deride. But nevertheless, he has a huge fan base in the United States. And what about the polling industry? Where, where are they right now this morning? Talk about egg on their faces. There was no blue wave. There was a, a little ripple is all it took. How could they get it so wrong? So financial markets basically back to the future. Central monetary, central bank monetary policy deciding everything. Um, and by the Federal Reserve in particular, COVID-19 vaccine, supposing we get one in 2021, we may well do, then the markets will be off again. And the gap between Wall Street and Main Street will widen even as we speak. So last night, was a victory for commodity prices, it was a victory for the lower dollar, and it was a victory for higher house prices. That's what we've got now. And um, and th there, there is a trillion dollar deficit uh, under the present. That won't change. So, so therefore, business back to usual then, as far as um, uh, the, uh, the American markets were concerned. Dow Jones up nearly one and a half percent yesterday. Uh, UK economy, Bank of England, no change in interest rates, but it's going to pump another one hundred and fifty billion dollars into the into the economy. Um, and the, our relationship, the UK's relationship with Europe, no clearer. Yesterday, apparently, the EU's Michel Barnier went back to Brussels with a very downbeat uh idea of what's going to happen. You see those people walking along the street. They're no longer walking along the street right now. Let me tell you about that. We have a lockdown here. Uh, and it's understood that the Chancellor of the Exchequer will be speaking later today, and he may well extend the furlough scheme. To commodities, gold trading, well, it's not getting to its 2000 level. It's around about 1920 as we speak, uh, but it will rise if the United States uh, adopts a sizable fiscal stimulus program, because it'll become more valuable than, uh, than, than the, the weakening dollar. Uh, and as far as oil is concerned, relatively flat. The day ahead, we've got those initial jobless claims coming uh, at around about the middle of the day, tipped to be 732,000. That's an improvement from the 751,000 we had registered uh, later in the week. Uh, but again, um, it's just a... <clears throat> It's, it's, it's just a, a weekly, uh, a weekly thing. I much prefer to look at uh, quarterly figures. And of course, the FOMC uh, will be telling us uh, later today uh, whether there will be a rate decision. I don't think there will be a rate decision. I, think, I don't think anything, anything will change. I think what they will do is they will say, just as they always have done, that we're, we're here to help, but uh, expect no changes there. So basically, um, a depressing look, I would have thought, from the American election. It doesn't matter who wins. The fishers have not been have not, have not been solved by this the polling industry has got it absolutely tragically wrong and there isn't a great deal of prospect for a fiscal stimulus that's the global view all right michael uh isn't the uk bleeding or hemorrhaging so badly you're going to extend the furlough scheme after you have a big debt burden set up by the first furlough scheme that was not seen to really help the people that needed the money in the economy just helped owners of businesses uh, you had missed the Brexit deal that is not going anywhere. You need to get these trade deals on and working. You have a gulf of minus 20% in the British economy caused by coronavirus. You're going for another lockdown this time around. What is happening to the British economy? Yeah, if... It I tell you what, you know, given the chance, a lot of people are asking that sort of question. I think what they are really asking as well is where is this scientific advice? Where has that gone? Why, why were they using statistics which are out of date? Why do we have a lockdown now where actual cases, the, the, the this, this, this percentage, this R rate, as they call it, is lower than 1% in some of the areas where this lockdown was actually applied before we had the national lockdown? I think there's a lot of questions about this. I'm not very optimistic that we're going to get um, uh, uh, any kind of vaccine much before the end of the year, even though we hear day by day that vaccines are happening. I don't see how they can, because vaccines have to go through a much bigger test than the normal drugs have to. Yes, you ask a very good question. I don't know the answer to it. I think it's very, very depressing indeed. 
The government um, will continue to, back, to to look to the Treasury for help. There's not going to they, they will have to increase taxes at some kind of stage. The Bank of England, as I said, will be pumping more money, but it's funny money that they're pumping into the economy, like most economies around the world. We, we will we will struggle, I think, over winter. And I, I think the spring is also this is when the prime minister says we will have beaten the the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic by the spring. I don't know about that. I mean, n nobody knows. But I think the gap between what's actually happening and the scientific advice is is a very, very large one indeed. And nothing has been solved by lockdown. And I don't think anything is going to be solved by the present lockdown either. I would predict that what people will do will lose patience with it and they will break that lockdown uh, because we've got a month of it coming up, national lockdown. I think people will say, do you know what? I don't care. I, I can I can look after myself. I don't need a government to tell me what to do. This is the price of living in a democracy. But even with all that apprehension, uh, Michael, uh, the prime minister got uh, overwhelming support in the House of Commons yesterday, uh, 516 to 38, and even Labour Party seems to be supporting him. Yeah. I, hit, so I, I would say, yeah, I, I see what the numbers are saying. I would still maintain that a lot of those politicians are voting for themselves. They have to vote that way because they have acceded to a policy which has continued this lockdown and, and the, the previous lockdown. They also did not unsupport the fact that there would be regional lockdowns as well. It's very complicated. I don't see what else they could have done. I, I, don't, I don't think that that's an indication of what the country is actually feeling right now. I think the country country is very angry indeed about this second lockdown because actually if you look at the numbers and if you go if you get get the um, statistics from hospitals they are not being overwhelmed their icu units are not being overwhelmed by covid patients and people are not dying in the way that they were before so there's a big disconnect between what the scientists are actually saying and remember these scientists you know, they are public servants. They get paid by the public purse. They are not in private business. They're not looking at gyms. They're not looking at restaurants. They're not looking at small businesses. They're not looking at the tail of all the supply industries to support small businesses, which will go under. That's what the real picture is. I, I, what, what happens in the House of, um, in, in Houses of Parliament, God bless them, is not what the companies feel, the country is feeling right now. I can imagine. And one name the country is calling is Kia Starmer, probably a new Thank you so much. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic, this or Morrow. Updates on any vaccine? I know the answer will be no anyway. Sad. Well, good morning, Rafai. Good morning, Dr. Batian. Good morning, Tundu. Those vaccines are in the work. In some places, we hear news that we may be having them as soon as December, but in small amounts, not enough to go around. Uh, but the vaccines are in the work, and some are in final stages, uh, like we know. But quickly, there are so many things we do not know about the coronavirus. However, something is certain. Majority of the cases we are seeing now are from two continents, the Americas and Europe. Uh, the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases globally now has surpassed uh, 47 million. If you do have those John Hopkins uh, number, 48 million as of now. And like I said, it's coming from two major uh, continents. Uh, in Europe, France, Italy, and the UK reported their highest numbers of new cases, while Andorra, the Czech Republic, and Belgium reported the highest rate per capita. Uh, you've talked about the US this morning. Let's also look at the US. Now, the US is responsible for the world's highest infections and deaths so far. Yesterday alone, the country recorded over 100,000 cases of the coronavirus. And we also know something, that we have seen Americans uh, perform their civic duty like we have never seen before in the history of the country. The numbers that turned out for these elections have been mind-blowing, uh, record-setting, and this is despite the pandemic. So despite the pandemic, Americans came out to vote for who should be the next president at the federal level, and of course, we had those state and local elections as well. Uh, specifically to England now, England is under a national lockdown. The second one, I had Michael talk about it. Uh, the British, uh, 
lawmakers voted 516 to 38 in favor of Prime Minister Johnson's plan to approve this month law, long lockdown plan for England. Uh, meanwhile, Britain recorded 492 deaths just yesterday, the biggest toll since May 13 and up from 397 on Tuesday. Under this lockdown, most shops will be closed to December 2nd, the bars, restaurants restricted to take out and delivery services. People will be ordered to stay at home except for work, exercise, essential shopping, and we also know that the schools will remain open. Um, Away to the Middle is the UAE, to be precise, where the Prime Minister and Vice President of the UAE, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, uh, has been given a coronavirus vaccine shot. Now, he shared this photograph on Twitter, showing him receiving the shot uh, from a medical worker. However, it is not clear what vaccination shot exactly he was giving, but we do know in June, the UAE and China announced the launch of phase three clin clinical trials for a vaccine developed by China's state-owned Sinopharm pharmaceutical company. Also in September, the country's health minister announced an approval for emergency use for frontline workers. Uh, he's just the latest person to receive the vaccine after dozens of other Emirati officials. To the African region now, where the WHO latest uh, week Weekly update shows that there has been a steady increase in the number of new cases reported in the past seven days on the continent. Uh, almost 33,000 new cases, that's 1% of the new global cases. Uh, although the number of new cases has increased slightly, the number of deaths recorded has declined. South Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia continue to report the highest number of cases. And talking about Kenya, President Uhuru Kenyatta has extended the country's nightly curfew to January 3rd. He's also banned political rallies for 60 days. He's asked senior government officials to work virtually as part of measures to contain the spread of COVID cases in the country. According to the president, the positivity rate uh, shot up from 4% in September listen to this, to 16% in October, a month difference. And that's what happens when you open and uh, complacency sets in, and Kenya is seeing that already. And talking about complacency, let's talk about home here in Nigeria, where the presidential task force is saying, uh, in a week or two, Nigeria remains in a critical, and maybe seen a critical condition as regards COVID-19, and the country is set to impose six months minimum passport ban on defaulting travelers. Yes, this is a warning and a threat coming from the PTF. You see those numbers, 63,000, 1,000 uh, 155 deaths, but the task force is saying that the nation has experienced several large gathering events during which non-pharmaceutical interventions were uh, were not really observed. Uh, they were implying events such as the off-cycle elections we saw in Edo and Ondo, as well as the NSAS protests. It also says they are seeing about 65% of those who return to to the country not showing up for their compulsory in-country PCR test. It promises that any moment from now, they will be publishing the first 100 persons to be suspended for defaulting on those compulsory tests and suspend their passport for six months. Well, so I think uh, we should, uh, I would like to focus on Nigeria yeah. and uh, that report by the uh, presidential tax force. They're talking about the risk of importation uh, that's what the uh, secretary to the government of the uh, federation is talking about. And the fact that most of the people who come into Nigeria, almost 65% of them, uh, do not uh, go through the uh, guidelines. Uh, and because of that, they would like to do what they call a passport suspension. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how that will work, but definitely that risk of importation could uh, drive up the numbers. And he also expressed concern about the likelihood of a second wave which is also consistent with the position of the NCDC of Nigeria in their epidemiological report. Mm -hmm. Now, are we doing enough testing? No. I doubt. Mm -hmm. You know, have we uh, become complacent? I think that seems to be very obvious on all fronts, both official and among the people. Yeah. Number three, uh, the um, uh, PTF is saying that whoever does not do any test after coming in within seven days into the country, then they will publish a list of the first 100 persons, would that not amount to stigmatization? Is it possible for the federal government to consider other measures? For instance, there should be penalties. Because I've always argued that, look, in those countries where those government guidelines have worked, there have been sanctions for persons who do not comply with uh, official guidelines. 
And then, of course, they say uh, what they do is PCR tests. In some other countries, they have adopted rapid antigen tests. Now, those rapid antigen tests, they have their own uh, issues, uh, false positives, false negatives. Uh, yes, in terms of accuracy. So, but in some countries, that's what they are adopting. So unless there is a penalty beyond the seizing somebody's passport, some of those people who are coming in from outside, some of them even have like two, three passports anyway, or basically two passports for those who have a dual nationality. So I guess government should introduce sanctions. There should be more testing. There should be more seriousness. Overnight, they reported 155 cases. And if you look at Lagos, 85. Now, those figures may even be more than that because we're not doing enough contact and tracing. We're, we, we, we're opening up, and uh, nobody is paying enough attention, either at the federal level or at the state levels. Well, I wanted to talk about the UAE, Jab, but apparently we don't have time. I wanted to ask you how risk-averse you are. Would you roll up your sleeves for a jab that's in the third and final stage? It's not like it's cleared the third and final stage. I'm not sure I would do that. I mean, anyway, but we don't know, Tundra. I'm on that boat with you. I mean, some people say that's leadership, but it's fine.